Welcome to NucleCast, the official podcast of the Anwa Deterrence Center. Each week, we bring you leading experts for a lively discussion on topics related to strategic nuclear deterrence. Our host is Dr. Adam Lowther, Director of Strategic Programs at the National Strategic Research Institute. The views of the hosts and the guests are their own. Welcome back to another great episode of NucleCast. Of course, as you recognize my voice every time, this is Adam Lowther. And today we have with us from a very long, long way away from Canberra, Australia, Carl Rhodes. He went to Australia to serve as the director of RAND down there, down under. And then he left RAND and he stood up. He's the founder of Robust Policy in Canberra where he provides analysis and assistance primarily to the government, but I'm sure he would help others. Carl, welcome to NucleCast. Hey, I'm glad to be here, Adam. Thanks for having me on, and uh, thanks for setting my alarm early this morning to make sure I'm up for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you're what? So it's I think it's, it's 314 here, and you're 15 hours ahead. So what time does that make that for you? Yeah, we're living in the future here, so it's uh, Saturday at 6 a.m. Oh, man, that's perfect. Perfect time for you to be on your game, 6 o'clock in the morning. So we decided to to have a chat, and, you know, with the, the prospective war that some people see as imminent, likely, between the United States and and China over Taiwan. And then, of course, the major allies, South Korea, Japan, Australia. And many folks are wondering, you know, what what role might they play? Will they try to play a neutral role? Or will they strongly support the United States? You have been an observer and participant over the last four or five years in this sort of milieu of, of Australia trying to decide what role it will play. So from your perspective, how do you see Australia trending in terms of what it wants to do in this sort of geopolitical fight of the future? Yeah. um, So that's a a really big question, obviously. Uh, So, well, looking to Australia, um, they've just released uh, a defense strategic review. Uh, So they usually do defense white papers, um, which lay out, you know, the strategy going forward. Uh, They asked um, two senior folks to conduct a review independent on the outside of how defense is doing in terms of Australia. And this follows on from a 2020 defense strategic update under the prior government, the coalition government, which is a little more right leaning than the current government, the labor government. Um, so the labor government came in and the 2020 defense strategic update that the last government came up with was the first to recognize that Australia doesn't have the 10 years of warning time uh, that they had typically assumed in the past that conflict would reach Australian shores uh, with a 10 year warning time, which gives them plenty of time to respond. Um, and they weren't exactly clear about who the competitor was in that document or the follow-on defense strategic review. But it is very clear, if you read between the lines, that we're talking about China. Um, so China is a significant threat. And Australia is concerned about a major strategic conflict in the Indo-Pacific um, and that competition happening. So as a response to that, Australia has done a couple things over the past two or three years, Uh, the first of which was the AUKUS announcement, um, and that happened in late 21, I believe, Uh, and that was an announcement that Australia was going to procure nuclear subs from the United States and the UK as part of that agreement, and it wasn't clear when they first announced it exactly what was going to happen, but that was announced earlier this year, uh, that they're going to start by getting some Virginia-class subs um, three to maybe five, depending on the delays, in the next generation sub, the AUKUS sub, that will be a kind of a coalition US, UK, Australia build of some kind. Um, 
and that still has to be designed, obviously. Uh, but the intent is to eventually build nuclear subs here in Australia. Um, and that is a big part of the future defense concern from Australia's point of view, uh, having that capability that is a sovereign operational capability that allows uh, Australia to um, kind of guarantee its own security. Um, so that's one piece of it. Uh, the other piece is, you know, Australia has very much tied itself to the United States going forward uh, in various uh, technology exchanges, in various force structure and force posture initiatives uh, that have, you know, U.S. troops potentially having the ability to come here. So there is a, a marine rotational force that's in Darwin six months of the year when the weather is good so they can train. Uh, the other six months, it rains a lot, so they get out of town um, for the most part and, you know, move away. But the Marines train very closely with Australia. I've been up to see one of their exercises up in the north and work together hand in hand on those kind of things. Um, so, yeah, I think there there are close ties between Australia and the United States, you know, whether Australia would jump in or not and whether the United States would jump in or not. You know, that's a that's a question of policy. And I think the United States is, you know, maintains a kind of an uncertain posture to maintain deterrence there. And Australia hasn't committed one way or another, but would consider quite strongly uh, in joining a U.S. coalition, I would think. Uh, just based on past experience with Australia and working with the United States. Now, the Australians looked at nuclear weapons, you know, in the, I think it was the 1950s, and, you know, made the decision largely for domestic political reasons not to go that route. Is there any discussion or thought now that with China on the right, I mean, China clearly wants to be, you know, some say, well, they just they want to be a regional superpower, but there's, you know, they probably want to be a global superpower. And Australia, you know, a nation of 25 million would find it difficult to compete against the Chinese. And they clearly know, you know, the United States is, what, 5,000 miles away. And so they, you know, may need at least for a period of time to take care of themselves. Has there been any discussion about, you know, should we reconsider nuclear weapons? Yeah, I would say the discussion is pretty limited at this time. There hasn't been much discussion yet. Uh, people are still confident that the extended deterrence will hold. Um, and actually, the Defense Strategic Review that was just released talks about deterring by denial in the northern approaches. So it talks about more about the conventional forces needed to prevent disruptions to trade or anything that any adversary might do in the northern approaches to Australia. Now, if you look north, you know, you've got, you know, some countries there like Indonesia, but further north is China. So uh, but in terms of nuclear weapons themselves, getting the nuclear subs, even nuclear power is a big step because Australia doesn't have nuclear power. The limit of Australia's nuclear capability is a kind of an experimental reactor or small reactor that does medical things uh, at Lucas Heights. Um, so there isn't a great deal of, you know, nuclear expertise here. So to build up just to maintain and potentially build down the road, the nuclear reactors here is going to take a lot of knowledge building and growing PhDs and growing people are knowledgeable in that area. Um, and that's going to take training at other sites like the United States and the UK. So they, so Australia doesn't even have any kind of nuclear power or anything of that sort. Nope. Not at all. Oh, wow. Uh, so so, it's, so it's a big step. <laughs> yeah. So that would mean they probably don't have, you know, university programs for nuclear engineering and nuclear physics and radial chemistry and things that, that you would need to have a, an indigenous nuclear program that that doesn't exist. That's what they're building up right now. So, I mean, they're, I think they're talking, wow. you know, they're going to have to grow on the order of 10 to 20,000 nuclear experts uh, from kind of a handful now. So, you know, standing up the university programs, yes, they need to do that. Um, standing up, you know, training programs for naval officers. Yes, they need to do that. And they're doing some exchanges from what I understand with the United States and the UK. 
uh, to put naval officers on those nuclear ships. So, yeah, so there's there's a lot that needs to be done just to get the nuclear subs uh, up and running, as well as all the policy that goes with that, right? I mean, there's a whole set of policy and oversight that goes along with any kind of nuclear reactors uh, that they're still building up here. Is there a domestic, you know, like a really large sort of domestic uh, distaste for all things, nuclear power, weapons, you name it. Is, is that sort of been one of the, the big reasons why there's absolutely nothing nuclear in Australia? Yeah, I think there is a historic um, drawback of that. And look, I'm I'm drawing from my time here, so this is a limited sure. view. Um, but I think there isn't a now that they've considered the subs. Uh, I think about half, at least half, the folks are in favor of them uh, based on polling. Um, so you know, there's. I think there are concerns, but they're starting to lower. There's also the concern about climate change, and Australia pulls a lot of coal out of the ground, um, not only, mostly to sell other places, but they use some of it here. Um, but there is a climate change concern, and how do you address that? And Australia has moved quite a bit towards um, certain types of clean power, like solar and wind, but that can only do so much. So looking forward, I think some are actually starting to consider now where they hadn't before uh, nuclear power as an option, as a potentially clean option, which it was never viewed that way as a clean you know, source of fuel before just due to the waste and potential for accident. Yeah, and it's kind of an interesting thing. You know, I'm sure you know well this, I forget what they, the theory behind it is, but, you know, it's this notion that you know, the technological first movers like the United States, they built all of the above ground telephone lines and then they built the below ground and then, then they eventually build cell phone towers. And then, you know, that point, you know, let's say in sub-Saharan Africa, they, they skip all that first generation infrastructure and go straight, you know, to advanced cell towers. And it seems like, you know, the Australians can skip, you know, generation one, two, and three of nuclear and go straight to fourth gen, which is, you know, it's really safe. It's really efficient. And they could avoid almost all of the challenges we've seen in, you know, Japan or Ukraine or the U S and just go straight to that really good, useful stuff. Yeah, that's, that's probably the case. And you're going to know much more about that than I do. Uh, but yeah, there there are ways I think to kind of move along to those very safe kind of technologies. Um, so in terms of nuclear power, I think there's been started to be some change in thinking in nuclear weapons. Um, Australia very much feels like the United States extended deterrence has them covered, and there are some strategic thinkers who will say, you know, eventually, not today, but down the road. Australia might need to think about nuclear weapons. Uh, but at this point in time, it's kind of a no-go zone uh, for many discussions to suggest nuclear weapons for Australia. Now, they are spending, you know, they're going to spend around $300 billion Australian dollars getting the nuclear subs. That's a lot of money. Sure, uh, yeah. Or nuclear-powered, not nuclear, you know, weapon-equipped subs. Sure. Um, so, you know, that's helping to guarantee deterrence against a major competitor. Are there other cost effective ways to do that? And, you know, I think if the strategic outlook changed enough, um, things could change here, but right now we're not at that stage. Now, one of the, you know, the, the South Koreans also wanted a similar deal and the U S has been reluctant to do that. You know, there's some concern that, you know, with, with, you know, when you use HALU and, you know, higher enriched uranium in these submarines, that it can therefore be additionally enriched to be weapons grade. And, of course, the United States is concerned that the South Koreans, who as a people strongly support uh, an independent nuclear weapons program, that they would use that subfleet to, you know, make that happen. Whereas apparently, I guess the U.S. isn't concerned that the Australians would would follow a similar path? Uh, is there yeah, uh, maybe may because of domestic views, I guess? 
I think a little bit of that, as well as um, Australia has been a very good safeguard of nuclear technology and all that, and has been you know, very aligned with the international organizations in terms of safeguarding those things. And actually, a big part to be worked out still is how does this, you know, these nuclear subs work under international treaties and all that. Yeah. Um, there is no prohibition, but how do you monitor such that there hasn't been tampering with the reactor to take materials out or things like that. That is still something that's part of that, you know, kind of technical policy aspect that needs to be addressed as part of the AUKUS program. Yeah. And I would assume that, uh, you know, as part of our relationship with the, you know, the Brits, they've, they've developed a reactor that we're putting on our new subs that, you know, it's a lifetime reactor that never needs to be refueled. So I think, you know, that would obviously make subs a lot, I guess, you know, sort of proliferation resistant because they never have to get refueled. And yeah, you know, exactly. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's the goal, I think with this program AUKUS and, you know, it's not clear that anything with the reactor will be built here. It'll probably be imported, I would guess, but that's, it all remains to be determined. You know, the Virginia class will get delivered you know, set up and built, uh, but the new AUKUS class, they may build it here, but not the reactor. And they might just deliver that as a sealed component that fits into the sub. Now it's that time in the show where we have to take a quick break, but when we come back, I want to, uh, I'm working on a, a Taiwan scenario tabletop exercise right now that takes place in 2028. And so what I'd like to ask you when we come back is how do you foresee this, assuming that Taiwan is never willing to reintegrate with, with China, how do you foresee the future playing out in regards to this issue? And then what do you see Australia doing? So, You're listening to Nuclecast. We're talking to Carl Rhodes, and we'll be right back. This episode of Nuclecast is brought to you by the AMLA Deterrence Center, whose mission is to educate Americans about the nuclear enterprise and strategic deterrence. Okay, and we're back. And before the break, I asked Carl, how do you think this Taiwan scenario is going to play out in terms of, you know, we, we think that China wants to have full reunification. And, you know, if it's done by conflict, they want to have all the buildings rebuilt by 2049 so that when they march, when the PLA marches down the streets of Taipei, there's no rubble left. And so therefore something's got to happen well before then. And there's, you know, I think Australian 60 Minutes is probably one of my favorite shows to watch to learn about what the Chinese are doing. They probably do it better than anyone. Uh, But Carl, how do you see this China-Taiwan issue playing out? And what do you think the role of the Australians will be in it? Yeah, so... A, let's hope that never happens because <laughs> it would be a very destructive war for everyone involved. Um, but should it happen, um, and let's let's hope deterrence holds, uh, but should it happen, I mean, there's been a number of war games on this, and the typical you know, opening is a large set of missile strikes against targets where the United States might flow troops or already has troops or aircraft or, you know, naval capabilities. Um, so... You know, that could easily draw Australia into the crosshairs very early uh, because um, with any conflict with China, you know, the United States is looking to base in a wide variety of bases around the Indo-Pacific. Putting all your eggs in one basket is a bad idea against that anti-access area denial missile threat. So, you know, 
putting things, you know, not just in Guam, but, you know, putting them in northern Australia, putting them in the Philippines, spreading them to many locations would be a good thing. But that draws those nations potentially into an opening round uh, of fires. Um, so that that is a concern. Uh, so Australia could be drawn in relatively early uh, through those attacks. Now, the the other option is China decides to hold off and just decides to focus on Taiwan without drawing other nations besides the United States in, knowing that the United States will likely respond. Um, so uh, at that point, you know, Australia is a little bit tied to the United States through basing of the nuclear subs. Uh, they've agreed as part of AUKUS to have uh, allow nuclear subs to base in Australia. Uh, you've got the Marines in the north. Uh, you've got airfields in the north uh, of Australia that could uh, be used by the United States. Uh, and you have Australian capabilities uh, that could be used. So Australia, as part of its defense strategic review, has called for an improved long-range strike capability, uh, precision and long-range strike. Um, and this not only comes from the air, it comes from ships, it will come from land-based forces. And the Australian Army has been directed to look at improving its littoral capabilities. So all those capabilities would be useful uh, in any conflict uh, involving China invading Taiwan and providing you know, capabilities to prevent that invasion. Um, so there are unique capabilities. And you know, Australia has developed some pretty cool capability of, of its own that the United States Air Force is interested in, including the wedge tail, uh, as well as the ghost bat. Um, those two aircraft, the wedge tail is a airborne uh, warning capability, you know, early warning capability. And the wedge tail uh, is an unmanned uh, thing, or not the wedge tail, the ghost bat is an unmanned thing that flies alongside fighters, uh, an unmanned aircraft that uh, can provide some capabilities. And I understand they've sent some across the United States to do some testing. So Australia has largely focused within its region, you know, influencing Micronesia and some of, you know, the islands in its general region. And the Chinese have played this very interesting role where they, you know, it's the, you know, the, they come in, they make loans, they build stuff, and then they've, they leave lots of, of Chinese behind. And in some of these Micronesian nations, they've so significantly reshaped the population demographics that they're, you know, that, that, you know, now, large Chinese population is shaping the outcomes of elections. And that's not, you know, the Australians have not been necessarily happy about that and have sort of become more assertive. Can you talk about how they're managing Chinese encroachment on their traditional sphere of influence? Yeah. Um, that's definitely a concern here, and the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is definitely engaged throughout the region here and has been over time because uh, Australia has very good partners in the Pacific Islands here um, and is very close to many of them. Now, some of them have taken money, taken uh, you know loans from China. Uh, there's been some concern about building ports on in a couple of these nations uh, that are more aligned with China than Australia. Um, and so there are concerns that China gains a foothold nearby that allows them a, an easy jumping point, much closer than the South China Sea and some of those islands that they've built out of concrete there. Uh, so Australia and the United States are both mindful here um, and, you know, continue to try to do good things with their influence here and work together with partners here in the region uh, who have concerns, you know, about security and all that. Um, so there are there are a number of programs happening in that front. And I understand the United States just recently signed a major security cooperation agreement with uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, which is to the north here. Um, so that's part of that, you know, constant competition. You know, some call it a gray zone. I call it, you know, what's been happening forever. It's nothing new. Uh, it's it's politics by diplomacy and influence by diplomacy, and it goes hand in hand with military influence. 
Yeah, and I think one of the things that's kind of interesting, and you know, I was I spent a lot of my time working NATO issues, and as I looked at, you know, some of the northern European countries, you know, Denmark and others, you know, they have far fewer, you know, far fewer people than than you know, not just the United States as a whole, but like, you know, I live in the Kansas City area and there are some northern European countries that have about the same population as the Kansas City metropolitan area. And, you know, we often don't realize just how small they are. And yet they've got embassies all over the world. They're flying F-35s. They're they're doing all these things that a large, great power does, and but on a much smaller scale. And we don't quite often realize just how small they are. And it, it, it has me thinking about Australia as a nation of 25 million. So less than one tenth the population of, you know, the United States. And we, we think of it as, well, it's a it's a country that's a continent. And I think we probably often overestimate just, you know, what's available and what a nation of 25 million can do as opposed to you know, a nation of 350 million. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's definitely the case. And, you know, Australia has to think hard about, you know, what their role is and where do they specialize? And this is why part of the defense strategic review was we need to have a focus force. We can't do everything. What's the best force to face our challenges going forward. And you look at, you know, Australia just trying to, to, man up the liaison positions that it has in the United States takes a significant, you know, chunk of manpower. Uh, but they're trying to grow the military here. Um, they're trying to grow, you know, the, the funding as well as the number of people in it, but there's limited capabilities here. Uh, you're exactly right. I mean, I come from, you know, Santa Monica, Los Angeles area. That's where I was with Rand and living there. And you look at Southern California it's about the same number of people as here in Australia. You know, that's, that's the comparison point for me, uh, yeah. which is an interesting one. Uh, but I mean, Australia is large compared to some of these small Pacific islands we're talking about. Some of those don't even have a military force. They just have a police force uh, because they're, you know, so small. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then to try to think about a region where you're, you know, how far exactly? I don't, you know, I don't really know. Uh, I can't speak. I don't recall offhand how far China is from Australia. It's a long way. Um, so I took a flight to Korea for a conference, and that was like an overnight flight. Uh, yeah. Singapore is like, I think it's like eight hours from Sydney, something like that. You know, um, the so, closest. The, closest international flight is New Zealand, which is three hours. <laughs> yeah. So you still have quite a bit of distance. You know, it's almost like the U.S. where we have, you know, oceans on both sides and friendly neighbors to the north and south. Australia is sort of still in that position. And so China's yeah, not Australia's an immediate got... problem. Nah, it would take them a while to steam down here. I'll put it that way. Now, missiles, long range missiles, you know, ICBMs could get here, obviously. Uh, some of their longer range missiles put in the South China Sea can reach a big chunk of Australia, not quite all of it. Uh, if you look at some of the projected range rings. Um, so, you know, in the past, I think there was less concern that China could reach. But with some of these long range missiles and they're thinking about, you know, how do they project power? Um, so some Chinese ships have been seen, you know, in the Australian economic zone traveling legally. Uh, but it's surprising because that hasn't happened in the past. Uh, so China is clearly practicing their ability to project power beyond their borders. So you are now a dual U S Australian citizen. So, you know, I'm going to speak to you as an Australian now. And yep. if, if you as an Australian could use, you know, I spent some time in the, mid nineties. And then again, after nine 11 in the middle East. And I don't, I don't think I ever told you this. Uh, I actually, when I was in the desert, I, I found a, a magic lamp and I, I can, I've made my three wishes, but I can let nuclecast guests make three wishes. And so I would like to let you make three wishes of my, of my, you know, magic lamp 
in regards to Australian security in the years of years ahead. So we've rubbed the lamp. Your three wishes are, are here for you. What would those three wishes be? Um, so as an Australian, I'm very interested in, you know, a rules based order where everyone signs up to the rules and follows them. Uh, so that's, that would be probably number one, that we come to a set of international rules that are fair and equitable and ensure trade for everyone. And we all agree to follow those things. And, you know, both the China's and the United States, such that the middle countries like Australia get a fair shake. Um, so, so that would be number one. Um, number two, you know, I, I think Australia is, has a lot of capability and could do a better job in terms of developing more sovereign capability around technology and defense. Um, and that would help ensure their, um, you know, deterrence and, you know, ability to provide a sovereign defense capability going forward. So, you know, I wish Australia would invest more in its own people and growing its own capabilities. So that's number two. Uh, Number three, um, that's a tough one. Let's see. Um, You know, I I hope the world maintains a peaceful place uh, because any conflict is expensive for everyone involved. Um, so, you know, I recognize that there's going to be wars. It's not like wars are going to stop. Uh, at some point, I think there were some, you know, historical observers that thought wars were going to end. Uh, but you know, if we can get wars not to happen, that'd be a good thing. But, you know, that's, that's kind of a big wish and probably too hard for the magic lamp even. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, that, that might be one that even my genie, uh, his name's Bart that uh, even he can't uh, answer. But so as you, you know, if if you want to leave the listeners here at Nuclecast with sort of a big takeaway about Australia and sort of what to think of it and what to make of it in terms of what Americans see as the future in Asia and potential conflict, what, what takeaway should they have? I think, first of all, Australia has traditionally and is looking to in the future continue to be a close U.S. ally. Um, Australia is very much, you know, interested in, you know, I wouldn't say supporting, but aligning with the United States uh, on areas of mutual interest. So that's that's number one. Uh, Number two is Australia has really gone through a major mindset change over the past five years or so since I've been here. Uh, So when I first got here, you know, Australia was still riding that line of can we get economic benefit from China while at the same time getting security guarantees from the United States? I think there's been some doubt about that going forward. Look, China's still a big trading partner with Australia, and it's about a third of the trade um, with Australia. And they take up a lot of iron ore and coal from here, um, which are high profit exports. Um, so, so yes, so that was kind of the mindset in 2017, 2018, um, since I've been here, it's evolved and people have kind of changed their mind and see now China as more of a threat, uh, and a concern going forward. And Australia is making significant changes as a result of that. The AUKUS deal is a generational change for Australia. I mean, It was headline news for days here. I mean, it was, I I know it was big news in Washington as well, but much bigger here. Um, And so the Australian mindset has changed the need to understand how to be a military uh, power in terms of Australia size power, as well as how to be resilient to these threats is also uh, a big concern here. So, yeah. So I, I think that mindset change is the big thing. Um, the Australian mindset has changed from, yeah, we're the lucky country and in a safe place to, yes, we actually need to be concerned now. Yeah. So let me ask you one final question because we're, we're out of time. And, you know, Australia has given the United States probably one of the greatest reality TV shows we've ever had, Farmer Wants a Wife. But I also wanted to ask you, are there any other great TV shows that, that we in the United States 
should be looking to Australia to watch. I mean, the office was British. What do we need to know about Australian television that we might be missing? Yeah. So I'll give you, I'll give you two pointers. Uh, So the first one is there's a show called Utopia here in Australia. I forget. I think they retitled it on Netflix, but it's about a government office called the national building authority. And it's similar to the office, but it's about a government organization and how it runs here in Australia. And it's amazingly close to real life at times. So that's enjoyable. Um, The other one, which I can't, I don't know if it started here or started in the United States is married at first sight. I've got some friends who are really big into that reality show. So that's really big down here. (laughs) All right. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a, any good comedies is I assume utopia is a comedy. Definitely Utopia is a comedy. All um, right. So and uh, I'll, I'll send you after this the uh, the Netflix title. So maybe you okay. can drop it in at the end. All right. Awesome. Well, Carl Rhodes, a longtime RAND analyst. He was now the founder of Robust Policy, where he supports the Australian government and uh, provides analytical advice. In there in Canberra, Australia. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing us, sharing with us the Australian perspective. Hey, thanks, Adam. Really appreciate the chance to be on here and uh, looking to great things on your podcast. I recognize a number of the people, so I need to go back and listen to a number <laughs> of those. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we've had some great guests. Uh, and of course, we have great listeners. So thanks to you, the listeners, again, for joining us on this episode of Nuclecast, and we will see you on the next episode. You know, it's kind of interesting to hear, you know, it's sort of an outside take from Carl as, as an American who lives in Australia and is now an Australian citizen and is, but still has sort of an American mindset and is looking at Australia and sort of analyzing what they're doing and why they do it and trying to understand the Australian perspective. And so I really enjoy talking to Carl you know, for, for that purpose, because he's, you know, he sort of sits in between two worlds, if you want to call it that. And his take on how the Australians think and the way they see, you know, China and the U.S. and the challenges of the future is certainly, uh, certainly interesting and I think helpful for us. This has been a production of the Anwa Deterrence Center. Our executive producer is Kimberly Charrington, and this episode has been engineered and mixed by David Frumthal. Follow the show on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at Nuclecast. Listen, follow, and review the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.